This is real footage of our sun ejecting billions of tons of material into space. A true-to-scale image of Earth has been added to the video to highlight the immense scale of this event. This phenomenon is called a coronal mass ejection, or CME. One of these eruptions missed Earth by just nine days. If it had erupted directly toward Earth, the consequences could have been catastrophic. Our sun is currently in a particularly violent phase of its cycle, with 2025 expected to mark its peak. The sun's magnetic poles are reversing as we speak. This is what the sun looked like in 2020, and this is what it looked like by the end of 2024. Clearly, the sun's activity has intensified significantly. As a result, the intensity and frequency of solar flares have increased considerably, leading to more frequent solar storm warnings. Scientists are particularly concerned that 2025, the peak of this solar cycle, could bring even more intense solar activity, raising serious concerns within the scientific community. What are solar flares and coronal mass ejections? Why do they occur? What kinds of damage have they caused in the past? What are the chances of such an event happening again? And what are we doing to study them? Let us explore all this through this video. Hi friends, welcome to a new episode of Science Simplified for All. The first major solar flare event recorded in history is the Carrington event, which occurred in 1859. At that time, the only communication device in use was the telegraph. The event disrupted telegraph networks across Europe and North America. Many telegraph operators even received electric shocks from their machines. Just one day before these disruptions, the scientist Richard Carrington observed and reported the first solar flare ever documented. 17 hours after the flare was seen on the sun, the associated charged particles reached Earth's atmosphere. The auroras, which are usually visible only near the poles, were visible in regions as close to the equator as the tropics. The light from these auroras was so bright that some people mistook it for dawn and began their morning routines early. In March 1989, another solar flare caused a massive power outage in Quebec, Canada, leaving 6 million people in darkness. It took 11 hours to restore power. More recently, in 2022, Elon Musk's SpaceX lost nearly 40 Starlink satellites due to a solar flare. The satellites lost control and burned up in Earth's atmosphere, resulting in a financial loss of approximately $50 million. In October 2022, during disaster relief operations in the United States following Hurricane Ian, a solar flare caused significant disruptions. All forms of communication systems stopped functioning, hampering the relief efforts. These are just a few examples from a long list of disruptions caused by solar flares. Now, imagine an event similar to the Carrington event happening in today's world. The consequences would be unimaginable. Mobile phones, computers, the internet, satellite communications, online trading, essentially everything dependent on electricity, would fail. Such a disaster could set the world back by 100 years. Now, let us understand what a solar flare really is. The sun is something we have seen since the day we were born, making it feel like a familiar presence, almost like a member of our family. But we often forget that the sun is actually a star, and it has a far more terrifying and unfamiliar side. Earth's diameter is approximately 12,700 kilometers, while the Sun's diameter is about 1.4 million kilometers, more than 100 times larger than Earth. This video shows Venus, a planet almost the same size as Earth, passing in front of the Sun. This gives us a clear perspective of how small Earth would appear in comparison to the Sun. We know that the energy source of the Sun is nuclear fusion. This fusion occurs in the Sun's core. The energy generated there first travels outward through the radiative zone and then through the convective zone until it reaches the sun's surface. The radiative zone transfers heat using radiation, while the convective zone uses convection, a process where heat is transported by the movement of plasma, similar to the way boiling water circulates. Matter as we know it exists in three familiar states, solid, liquid and gas. However, Due to the sun's extremely high temperatures, these states cannot exist on the sun. Instead, 
all matter on the sun is in the fourth state of matter called the plasma state. In this state, atoms lose their electrons, becoming charged ions. This plasma is responsible for transferring heat through the convective zone. The convective zone has a thickness of approximately 200,000 kilometers. Inside this zone, the hot plasma becomes less dense and rises toward the surface, carrying heat with it. Once it reaches the surface, the plasma loses heat in the form of radiation, which travels in all direction as sunlight. After cooling, the plasma becomes denser and sinks back into the convective zone, where it gets reheated and rises again. This cycle continues endlessly. This constant movement within the convective zone creates channels of plasma that rise and fall. When we capture close-up images of the sun, we see small granules on its surface. These granules are the tops of the plasma channels within the convective zone. One important thing to remember is that plasma consists of charged particles. When these charged particles flow, it is equivalent to an electric current. And wherever there is an electric current, a magnetic field is always created. Inside the sun's convective zone, the small plasma channels flowing up and down generate very strong and complex magnetic fields. When plasma reaches the sun's surface, it stops moving upward. However, the magnetic field lines do not stop there. Instead, they form closed loops. These loops can sometimes extend thousands of kilometers above the sun's surface. Occasionally, small amounts of plasma follow these magnetic field lines and move outward from the sun. The video you see here shows plasma rising along a strong magnetic loop, ejecting outward and then falling back to the sun's surface like rain. On the sun's surface, this may appear as a small event. But when compared to the size of Earth, the true scale of this phenomenon becomes clear. Magnetic field lines themselves are invisible to us. However, we can infer their presence by observing the delicate filaments of plasma that follow the shape of these loops on the sun's surface. When these magnetic fields interact with each other, a significant amount of energy gets temporarily stored within them, much like a stretched spring or a drawn bowstring. However, in certain situations, these field lines collide or reconnect, releasing the stored energy almost instantaneously. Along with this energy release, large amounts of plasma are ejected from the sun and a burst of intense radiation is emitted from that specific region. This phenomenon is known as a solar flare. The energy released during such flares can be equivalent to the simultaneous detonation of millions of atomic bombs. While much of the ejected plasma falls back onto the sun's surface, some of it escapes permanently, becoming part of the solar wind that travels throughout the solar system. Even when solar flares are not occurring, the sun continuously emits a small stream of particles in the form of solar wind. During a solar flare, however, the ejected material significantly increases the strength and volume of this solar wind. In some cases, a solar flare is accompanied by the ejection of massive amounts of plasma from the sun's outer layers. This phenomenon is called a coronal mass ejection, CME. The video here shows the size of a CME compared to Earth. Such events eject billions of tons of material into the solar system, causing a dramatic increase in both the intensity and strength of the solar wind. The light from the sun spreads almost equally in all directions. However, the material ejected during a CME travel only in the direction of the ejection. This has both advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that we need to worry about a CME only if it is directed toward Earth. Since CMEs can be ejected from any part of the sun's surface, the chances of one being aimed directly at Earth are relatively low. The disadvantage, however, is that if a CME is directed at Earth, the energetic charged particles it carries will reach us before they have had a chance to spread out significantly. This means the impact on Earth would be much stronger compared to material that is spread over a larger area. Now, let us look at the effects of solar flares and CMEs on Earth as well as Earth's defenses against them. When a solar flare occurs, it releases a massive amount of X-rays. However, these X-rays never penetrate Earth's atmosphere and therefore cannot reach us directly. Instead, the charged particles and intense magnetic fields associated with solar flares have a more significant impact on Earth. These can lead to what is known as geomagnetic storms. 
We know that Earth has its own magnetic field, which serves as the first line of defense against charged particles from the solar wind. This magnetic field acts as Earth's primary shield, deflecting most of the charged particles. A disturbance in this magnetic field caused by solar activity is what we refer to as a geomagnetic storm. The second line of defense is Earth's atmosphere, which blocks charged particles that manage to get past the magnetic field. Here is a visualization of Earth's magnetic field. The Sun is located in this direction. If you observe closely, you will notice that the magnetic field's shape differs between the side facing the Sun and the side facing away. This difference is caused by the continuous flow of solar wind, even under normal conditions. The charged particles in the solar wind exert a magnetic pressure, compressing Earth's magnetic field on the Sun-facing side. Meanwhile, on the opposite side, the field stretches outward and remains less compressed. Under normal circumstances, charged particles in the solar wind cannot directly penetrate Earth's magnetic field. Instead, they are deflected to the sides. When these deflected particles reach Earth's polar regions, they align with the magnetic field lines. At this point, a small fraction of the particles can follow the field lines into Earth's atmosphere. As these particles interact with the gases in the atmosphere, they produce the beautiful light displays known as auroras. The different colors of auroras are caused by interactions with various gases in the atmosphere at different altitudes. Now imagine a powerful solar flare, significantly increasing the intensity of the solar wind directed toward Earth. In such a scenario, Earth's magnetic field would become highly compressed on the sun-facing side. This compression would allow the charged particles to approach Earth's atmosphere much more closely. Some particles might even enter the atmosphere before reaching the polar regions. Such events can lead to a wide range of effects. The first effect is power grid failures. Changes in Earth's magnetic field and disruptions in the ionosphere caused by charged particles can induce huge currents in long-distance power cables. This can overload power grids and cause widespread outages. Second effect is radio communication disruption. Shortwave radio communication relies heavily on the ionosphere in Earth's atmosphere. Charged particles from the sun can disturb the ionosphere, leading to interruptions in radio communication. Third effect is auroras. The size and brightness of auroras will increase significantly. Auroras, which are usually visible only near the poles, may become visible over much larger areas. Now, imagine a much more powerful solar flare and coronal mass ejection hitting Earth something similar to the Carrington event of 1859. The effects on Earth's magnetic field would be catastrophic. It would appear as though the magnetic field were completely swept away, with the field on the sun-facing side being almost entirely compressed. Such an event would disrupt all forms of communication systems. All electrical systems and power grids would fail. Electronic devices without proper protection could sustain severe damage. This could bring down computer networks, disrupting banking systems, trading, and almost anything that depends on the Internet. With banking systems down and stock markets frozen, global economies could collapse overnight, plunging the world into financial chaos. Global navigation systems like GPS would fail, grounding planes, disrupting shipping routes, and causing chaos in transportation and military operations worldwide. Even critical emergency services, like hospitals and first responders, would face severe disruptions, leaving societies vulnerable during the crisis. The damage in space, however, would be even greater. Unlike Earth, space lacks an atmosphere to provide protection, and Earth's magnetic field is weaker in space. A Carrington-level event would severely impact satellite operations, potentially knocking out many satellites. The greatest concern, however, would be for astronauts aboard the International Space Station. They would face extremely high levels of radiation exposure, posing serious health risks. In short, such an event could set back Earth by 100 years. Given the potential problems solar flares and CMEs can cause, it is crucial to study the Sun in great detail. Only by doing so can we predict such events in advance and take the necessary precautions. To achieve this, NASA and the European Space Agency have conducted several space missions and launched many spacecrafts. 
One of the most notable is the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. This spacecraft is positioned at the L1 Lagrange point, located between the Sun and Earth. Similar to the L2 Lagrange point, where the James Webb Telescope is positioned, L1 allows continuous observation of the Sun while maintaining constant communication with Earth. Launched in December 1995, this observatory has provided us with significant insights about the Sun. Another key spacecraft is the Solar Dynamics Observatory SDO, launched in 2010. It operates in a geosynchronous orbit around Earth and is equipped with advanced technology. The SDO captures images of the Sun in various wavelengths of light, including ultraviolet and visible light. These images reveal different aspects of the Sun's activity. For instance, many of the CME images I showed earlier were captured by SDO. Besides SOHO and SDO, many other spacecrafts have been launched to study the Sun. Through decades of observations, we have learned several key things about the Sun. One of the most important discoveries is that the Sun's activity follows a cyclic pattern known as the solar cycle, which typically lasts around 11 years. During this cycle, the Sun goes through periods of low and high activity, called the solar minimum and solar maximum, respectively. During a solar minimum, the Sun's activity level is very low, with few sunspots and almost no solar flares or CMEs. In contrast, during a solar maximum, sunspots increase significantly and solar flares and CMEs occur frequently. Another striking feature of the solar cycle is the flipping of the sun's magnetic poles. During each solar maximum, the magnetic poles reverse. North becomes south and south becomes north. The poles flip again during the next solar maximum, completing a full cycle. Not all solar cycles are the same. Some are stronger, while others are milder. The next solar maximum is expected in 2025, and the frequent solar flares we are currently observing are signs of this approaching maximum. However, scientists have noted something unusual about this cycle. It is showing intense solar flares earlier than usual. This is why scientists are especially concerned. To study how the solar cycle affects the solar system as a whole, a dedicated field of physics called space weather has emerged. This field involves satellites and observatories specifically designed to monitor solar activity. When a solar flare occurs, the additional radiation reaches Earth first, followed by the energetic particles hours or even a day later. This time gap allows for early warnings, enabling us to prepare and reduce the potential impact of a strong solar flare. While the likelihood of an extreme solar flare being directly aimed at Earth is relatively low, the risks cannot be ignored. Scientists and monitoring systems are working tirelessly to track solar activity and issue warnings well in advance. By staying vigilant and prepared, we can significantly reduce the potential consequences of such events and navigate the solar maximum as safely as possible. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment. For more videos like this, subscribe to this channel and enable the bell icon. Thank you.